This evening we have quite a mystery story. We'll begin on the campus of the University of Ingolstadt, Bavaria, about the year 1770. In a time of great political and social unrest, perhaps young people starting out in life have the clearest and most immediate recognition the kind of a world into which they are going to be forced by circumstances to live and make their ways. Now, on this campus, there were a great many groups of young men who took world conditions seriously, who resented the limitations imposed upon their abilities by a traditional and reactionary curriculum, and like many of the young people of today, were convinced that there were better ways of thinking and better ways of doing things than were being taught to them. The atmosphere was tense with reformation and revolution. The general discontent of masses extended even into the comparatively placid atmosphere of Bavaria. At this time, a young man was making quite a mark for himself in the faculty of law of the university. When only 27 years of age, he was made dean of the faculty of law, a remarkable indication of his own internal abilities. This man's name was Adam Weishaupt, and on May 1st, 1776, just two or three months before the signing of the Declaration of Independence in the United States, Adam Weishaupt founded the Order of the Illuminati on the campus of the University of Ingolstadt. Now, the original form of this society has been said to involve two distinct elements, a noble concept of purpose and a total absence of plan. This would be appropriate under the condition a movement led by a very young man, fired by still younger men, his own students, whose predicament touched him very deeply. The order of the Illuminati began with five persons and began in the rooms of the Dean of Law. The study of the Illuminist order in its brief history tells us that while numerically its membership was never large, the quality of that membership was reminiscent of the Almanac de Gotha. Practically every important man in the progressive motion of European life, including a number of princes and rulers, were members of this fraternity. One of the earliest actions decided upon by Weishaupt was the tremendous necessity for the maintenance of complete secrecy. At that time, Ingolstadt was a Jesuit college. The struggle between the church and the liberals was to be heated and constant. And so the Illuminati devised an ingenious scheme. They took a map of Europe and they divided it according to a map of the ancient world restoring in different places the names of then forgotten or at least long dead empires and kingdoms. They then divided their own members, assigning to each one a classical name by which it would be almost impossible to identify it. And they wrote their own private historical geography of world situations. It is important to note that in their new geography, the Illuminati assigned the name Egypt to Austria. And from that time on, in all of their official documents, references to Egypt were references to Austria. The purposes behind the motion of the Illuminati were several. First and perhaps foremost, the advancement of the right of the human being to think. That intellectual progress should be rescued from a reactionary traditional form and allowed to develop and unfold according to humanist concepts and instincts. Another important phase of their activity was the statement of their slogan or the motto of their society, namely, liberty, equality, and fraternity. And these exact words later became the cry of the French Revolution. There is much to indicate that the French Revolution was influenced by the Illuminists, or the Illuminati, who moved behind the surface picture, and whose names were associated with a number of prominent individuals and intellectuals moving in the great era of revolutions. So in a quiet but persuasive manner, the Illuminati spread beneath the surface of European thought. And its principal rituals, ceremonies, and rites were based upon the mysteries of the Greeks and Egyptians. For Weishaupt himself was a classicist, 
and among his desires was to restore the great philosophical systems of initiation education which dominated the ancient world. And in their brief span, the Illuminati became a most disconcerting force in European politics, largely because they were so difficult to identify and their presence was universally suspected whether they were there or not. The power of this organization became almost similar to that of the Ku Klux Klan in the South after the Civil War. It was feared by many, honored by some, and regarded as little short of miraculous by others. It gradually attracted to itself an elaborate symbolism derived partly from alchemy, partly from mythology, partly from capitalism, and all the mysterious secret societies of the 16th and 17th centuries. In the midst of all this excitement, Adam Weishaupt became a Freemason, and this was to have a bearing upon the later development. For the lodge that he joined was almost immediately absorbed into the Illuminist movement, and it was not until considerably later when the great Masonic councils were held to clarify the degrees and rights of the order that the Illuminists were forced to clarify their Masonic position. It was all quite an involved and difficult situation, but this is one of our roots. Baron Ignace von Born, a metallurgist and highly honored in the court of Maria Theresa. This important man was a personal friend of Mozart, and it is believed that in the designing of the opera, The Magic Flute, von Born supplied much of the material, at least symbolically speaking, for the creation of the character of Sarastro, the great priest of the mysteries of Isis and Osiris. Mozart himself was recommended for Freemasonry by Baron von Gemmingen, a distinguished member of the order, and the lodge to which he belonged was also very closely associated with von Born. And when this great chemist perfected his method for metallic amalgamation and certain formulas for the hardening and purifying of metals, Mozart wrote a piece of music to be played in the lodge, which at that time held a festival in honor of von Born. On one occasion, Goethe was told that the magic flute was little better than a fantasy. He replied, it may seem so to the average spectator, but not to those of us who are initiated. And he seemed to be very clear in his statement of this point. The Egyptians divided the universe into three essential parts. One was a universe of spirit, or of eternal life, the abode of the gods. One was a sphere of matter, which as in the case of the Platonic philosophy in Greece was called the underworld. And between these two was the abode of heroes, or of those who had liberated themselves from darkness, or who had been born again through the rites of the mysteries. In Egypt, as in many other ancient customs, we find that Isis, as the mother of mysteries, as the great Diana, goddess of the Ephesians, the Multamamia, the universal mother, that this deity always represents the mystery school itself. She is the widow whose sons become the liberators and the golden hawks of light who are to save the world. Therefore, the initiate was always referred to as the son of the widow, because Isis, wearing the weeds of a widow and with ashes upon her head, wandered about the earth, mourning the loss of her lord, the god Osiris, and consisted principally of an account of the wandering of the human soul in the underworld during the state of mortality or ignorance, disguised as a phantom, and the struggle between man, his mind, his being, his life, and delusion is a very important one. It is man subject constantly to the delusions of his own emotions and thinking. This is actually excellent Buddhism because it is told to us in the teachings of the Diamond Sutra, the fantasy of ambition, the fantasy of pride, of selfishness, of greed, the fantasy of passion and appetite, the fantasy of success or failure, all of the innumerable forces which deprive man of his natural nobility. We perhaps know a little better about this fantasy element than was generally known a hundred or two hundred years ago, because it is coming strongly to us in our studies of psychology. We know that the delusions, frustrations, neuroses, complexes, and psychoses 
which affect man are nothing but delusions arising within himself. His own false estimations of value, his own misunderstandings, his own natural instincts to be selfish, to create doubt and uncertainty, and his criticism, his jealousy, all of these things turning upon him like monsters, destroy his peace of mind and prevent him thereby from fulfilling the natural destiny for which he is intended. The truth seeker discovers the world around him is filled with people who do not wish to know anything, not interested in seeking truth. They have no ambitions of any importance, no aspirations. They do not know how to tell the truth. The magic flute bridges the great initiation rites of the elements from about the rise of Kabbalism in Spain under the Moors through the Rosicrucian hermetic cycle into the Illuminus and finally into the works and rituals of St. Germain and Cagliostro. We find the initiation of the four elements taking place. These represented the passage of the neophyte through the four elements to represent victory over earth which is the physical life, water, which is the vital or psychic life, fire, which is the emotional nature, and air, which is the mental principle. These four initiations are man learning to control the four vehicles or bodies which he has at his disposal, the physical, vital, emotional, and mental bodies. His victory over these bodies is achieved by his victory over the principles which they represent. The victory over materialism is therefore the initiation of earth, represented primarily by the subterranean location and by the burial in a stone sarcophagus, which is appropriate to the principal symbolism of earth. Transition through water, or the crossing of a flooded stream, or as in the case of the druid initiate, who is sent out to sea in an open boat without oars, which he must control by his will. The initiation by water represents the purification of the vital principle, as representing the purification of the generative power of man. The initiation of fire, represented in this rite by a long passageway filled with smoke and flames and combustion, indicates man's control of the intensities of his emotional and desire natures. Here he must fight with the fire within himself, the fire of hate, the fire of anger, the fire of lust the fire of temper. All of these things must be subdued because unless man controls these emotions he cannot have ultimate victory. The initiation of air either takes place upon some highly mountainous region or involves a motion through the air, a teleportation, or being carried like the Chinese immortal from this world to the other on a cloud. The airy element was the principle of mind or thought and the subduing or overcoming of the mental nature and the mental instincts constituted victory over the element of air because it was this air which by its vacillation, its inconstancy, and its inability to attain a state of discipline or settledness, its abstraction, its invisibility, like thought itself, caused man to have great difficulties in controlling it, directing it, mastering it, and finally dedicating it to the purposes of the mysteries. It is that the individual is dying to an old life, or to an old way of life. His rebirth is the symbol of the resurrection of consciousness from body. It is the restoration of the glory of the soul. It is the soul that has now achieved conscious freedom from the enmeshments of the body, or of true reality. The name of the opera is derived from the magic flute. Like the musical instrument of Orpheus, it seems to have an interesting history. The Orphic lyre had seven strings, the magic flute had seven notes, and this flute is the same one that is carried by Krishna in India, and upon which he plays the mysterious melodies which charm the gopis and cause the shepherd maidens to dance in their circle of twelve around him, as symbolical of the zodiac moving in its sacred dance around the sun. This also is the mysterious instrument of Shiva. Mozart himself was working for this very end, that man, humanity, the young prince and princess, should be led together to liberty, led to a better way of life, led to an opening of universal opportunity, and that ultimately the reign of wisdom would be established in the world. 
This was attempted in the French Revolution. It was also attempted in the American Revolution. This is not a comic opera, nor was it intended primarily to amuse. It was intended to strike the conscience of the people of Austria, and later the people of the world. In this case, the king was a queen, Maria Theresa. But the purpose of the opera was to catch the conscience of Austria and to cause this nation to become a leader in the spiritual life of Europe. But it was Mozart's dream and hope that this country would lead the great restoration of learning. In Mozart, Austria lives. In Mozart also, the Illuminati found a name and a patron who has conferred upon them eternal honor. <laughs>